Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I am your host, Kevin. It is my morning, but it is Claire Walton's late afternoon, early evening, as she's in the UK when we're recording. So I might be a little more caffeinated than usual, but I promise I will keep it reined in and let Claire do most of the driving because I've already had a chance to chat with her a little bit, and she's awesome. I'm just going to let you know that. You're going to find it out for yourself, though, in a minute. Claire is a leadership and high-performance coach, coaching executive and C-suite leaders, and their teams to achieve peak performance. With a track record as an executive director and 25 years of experience coaching these C-suite leaders and their teams, she's now also the author of the Amazon bestseller. Let me see if I'm pronouncing this right. Super Neuro You. Is that correct? Super Neuro You, which was published just last year. Claire, I'm, as you could tell, I'm already very excited to talk to you. Thank you for taking some time this week to come on the pod and chat with me. Ah, you're welcome, Kevin. So you have... Clearly, you've had a long journey to get from where you started to where you are now. So I like to ask this as kind of like a two-part question because I find that people people have very similar but also very unique answers. How did you, and this is like your superhero origin story, like how did you find out, discover, how were you told, how did you find the word coach? How did you figure that out about yourself that that's what you wanted to be or maybe you already were? And how did that realization discovery move into the coaching business you have today? Okay, that's great. So <laughs> well, I started my first career was in HR, human resources, whatever you want to call it these days. It's called all sorts of different things, of course. Um, but it was HR back then. And, and and we were trained to be coaches. So I didn't all of a sudden have some realization. You know, we were trained as part of our roles back in my early 20s to do coaching just as, as part of the day to day. So not as a professional coach, but, you know, in our relationship with our managers that we were working with and leaders that we were working with, we were expected to be coaching them. So, in other words, asking them lots of great questions to get them to think in order for them to solve their problems for themselves in the simplest of terms. That's what it was back then. And I absolutely loved it. Um, <laughs> but what was really interesting was that some of the people that I would, you know, turn a, a, a coaching, a conversation to a coaching conversation with, they wouldn't love it so much because they weren't necessarily expecting this. Now, you've got to bear in mind, Kevin, that I am going back several decades. <laughs> you know, people were used to being managed. They weren't even used to being led so much. They were used to being managed, told what to do, directed, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I, I always remember there was a specific lady that worked for me um, called Heather Lord. And I remember she, she she called me this one particular day and she's, she's told me about it. So called me this particular day and she, she outlines this whole situation that, that she's in. And I just back it off bat it back to her and I say, so what do you think you should do? And she said, oh, well, I don't know. That's why I'm ringing you. So mm -hmm. then I just changed, same question, changed the tone. Yeah, but what do you think you should do? Well, well, I don't know. That, that, and she's getting annoyed with me that, you know, that, that's why I'm calling you. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what do you think you should do? And just basically asked the same question three times. It was a very mm -hmm. typical, like, annoying coaching thing. <laughs> she, wasn't being, she wasn't expected to, to be coached when she called, you know, for me to solve her problem. But eventually she gave in and she started to work it through. And I coached her through that. I met her 20 years after this, which is probably still more than 10 years ago from today. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, oh, my, that was such a big lesson for me. And, you know, it made such a difference because I stopped calling you. I felt that, you know, you trusted me to make, you know, the right calls and mm. I started thinking things through for myself and my confidence developed. And then I started doing that with others and then I empowered them and so on. You know, we coaches can have a huge ripple effect on people. I had no idea at the time that that's what I was doing, but yeah, that, that's where it all started. And I've, I've continued, but coaching internally for many years, you know, I was a HR director of many large businesses over here in the UK. And the coaching that you do internally can be very effective. But I knew that the coaching I could do externally as a professional coach would be so much more effective for a number of different reasons. First of all, you know, it, it has become my profession. And as we were talking before we started recording, it, it's it's my passion. It's mm -hmm. I can't help but do it, whether I'm in, you know, inverted commas at work 
or just on a Saturday afternoon with a friend. You know, I, I, I literally cannot help myself to do this. So it's my passion. It's it's what I do professionally. So, you know, I, I do so much education around what I do. I would like to think I had a reasonable amount of expertise. <laughs> and all as a HR director, you're doing coaching as part of the job. And, and, and actually, you've got loads of other skills that you have to you know, have as, you know, quite a core day-to-day skill set, which I've been able to to drop now, which is fantastic. And then the second thing is the relationship is very different when you're external. So that relationship now as as the the external, I almost find immediately, Kevin, when people choose to have a call with me to discuss coaching, they allow me into their life, they allow me into Mm -hmm. their head, they allow me into their unconscious, <laughs> that's to me for some reason, to help them explore all of that and come out to all the better for it. So, so yeah, it's, 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 my coaching has changed over several decades and now it is pretty much my life's work. I, I can't tell you how many jumping off points I got from you talking just for the last couple of minutes. I was like, in my head, I'm just like, my gosh, I could... I can already tell it's going to be like ripping like the bandaid off the skin to hang up on this call. But the one thing that I love about the way you expressed your coaching journey there is that talking about that externality, which I feel like it's so, I don't know if it's, I I think it's very well understood by coaches, but I don't know if it's very well understood by the people who are coached because I think often about that sort of quote unquote intimacy of a stranger where it's like Mm -hmm. how sometimes someone who you just met, you could be your complete self with, and you'll share things with that person, whoever they happen to be, whatever the context you happen to have met them in, that you haven't shared with family, with friends, with loved ones, with parents, with people who have been in your life who know you better than anybody else. And it's often just kind of like, it's acknowledged as a, almost a quirk of the human condition, but really it's very foundational because that externality that a coach can bring with the tools of intimacy, with the tools of empathy, they can build that bridge, but you don't bring the baggage. You don't have the calluses built up. You don't have the expectations set. A lot of people, once they get to know you, they kind of subconsciously, for the most part, they put little walls in place. They kind of understand how to interact with you in the way that they want to. And they just kind of build up these like, you know, calluses, walls, guides, everything's kind of already built. A coach can come in with those expert tools of empathy and connection with all the professional experience of understanding how this works in a professional setting, even though you're being very personal and intimate with some of the things you're talking about. And they leverage that externality to allow someone to truly express what they really need to express and truly engage with what they maybe really need to engage with those. And that's the other thing too, that I love that insistence on the question. It's like, I'm just going to ask it again. I'm going to put a, put the emphasis on a different syllable and you're going to ask it to you again. And you're going to get annoyed with me, but you're going to understand why later. And you're going to love me for it. <laughs> and I just, I love that you, that you I basically identified that really early and have just like grown and evolved with that throughout your coaching career. Please go, talk, talk, talk. <laughs> well, that point that you just made there about the 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 one question asked three times, slightly. Yeah. I think all too often an inexperienced coach is looking for some really complex thing that they can do with their client to make a real difference. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I've learned over the years of both internal and now, you know, professionally coaching externally, which I've been doing for many years as well, actually simple things. So it's everything that you mentioned in terms of the relationship and the tools and the techniques of a really good coach around that that empathy, that ability to to demonstrate absolutely no judgment whatsoever of Mm. the person. Mm -hmm. You may well challenge what the person is saying, and I will challenge a lot. And actually, it's one of the things that my coaching clients, if they're referring me to some, referring me, recommending me, they will say, I'm quite challenging. Mm. Yeah, I am quite challenging, but I'm not judging the person. And I think that they're two very different things. I might challenge what they say. In fact, I literally put the um, a call down to somebody two minutes before I came on with you. And mm. uh, and it was, it was someone I not actually had a, a call with before. It's the chemistry type call. And in that, I was quite, challenging of some of the things that they were saying but not judging them as a person and they're two very different things um and I think you know that's that's pretty important for us coaches it really is because it's it's so it's so frightfully easy for most human beings myself very much included to accidentally internalize a criticism even if it's not like even if it's actually not really a criticism just something that 
could be interpreted as one and just bring it inside and put it in my heart and then like not realize I've done this. And all of a sudden I'm criticized. I'm vulnerable in a way that I'm, I'm a little bit scared. And all, like my, my, all my senses and my thoughts get flooded with that sensitivity and that fear that I basically grabbed and took and made into that myself, even yeah. though it was maybe maybe it wasn't even a challenge maybe it was just a night a good question good questions are like inherently like you feel like a little pressure on your skin when someone asks you a good question and learning how to and being taught how to acknowledge a good question and not like do any of the weird you know damaged math that we can sometimes do with our heads and our hearts and turn it into something else just let that question apply the, the needed pressure you know and then you know ask it again I, that's what I, I love about the simple re-asking of the question I'm not I'm not here to like apply the magical formula and you know carry the two to the nth power and then all of a sudden bam you're going to have an epiphany every once in a while stuff like that will happen but usually it's just the insistence on asking the simple questions and listening to the responses with care and yeah. i i know it doesn't sound fancy it doesn't sound like some world changing thing but it is in my experience quite frankly it is world changing it is life changing and i love that yeah, I love I love insistence. I have a feeling I'm going to have to work the insistence of your challenge into something into the podcast title because I feel like that's just that's such a key to the power you can have as a coach. And I I, I know I'm mostly just responding to you instead of asking follow up questions, which I'm I have bad podcaster brain now, but I'm just so fascinated by how this works and how how simple it is to see, but then how you can spend your whole life understanding how it works and how to how to help people with it. But now, but let's just underline this point, because it's really actually in this conversation, I've only really thought about this with absolute clarity now, mm. is how in order to be incredibly challenging in a way that inspires action, because that's what we're after really, aren't we? We're not challenging for the sake of challenging, we want to inspire <laughs> action, it's paramount that we don't judge and the person doesn't feel judged and actually I just realized how darn good I, I am at this stuff because I just <laughs> realized that is what I'm doing these days. I can ratchet up, dial up that challenge to inspire action, which creates change because I'm so much better than I ever was. And it, it takes years, and I've been doing this for years now, at building a relationship pretty quickly where there's no judgment. And now what I'm thinking as I'm speaking, Kevin, is what exactly am I doing to create that part of it? Comes naturally. Now you have to figure out how to like codify it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But that's really important, isn't it? Because if I go back to when I mentioned to you when I first was trained to do coaching, we were doing that. This was in my early 20s. And we were doing that as part of a cultural change in a huge organization over here in the UK. It's a big supermarket organization that actually Walmart eventually took over. Right. And, and we were we, we were using the coaching to develop the people who were running the, the, the stores, the supermarkets. Mm. As part of that exercise, one of the things, the culture change exercise as well, one of the things that we were doing is trying to help those it was like the top 5% of our supermarket general managers to help them to codify what it was that they were doing that made them successful. That You just reminded me of that. So that was running along the same side of things. And again, something that I've taken away from that 30 years on <laughs> is helping myself and my clients codify what is helping them achieve success as they go through the coaching journey. And so what we do as part of that, and I'm insistent upon, is some form of self-reflection where they're writing their reflections down. So whether it be journaling mm. or, uh, you know, it could be just freehand journaling, which is what I personally prefer, or it, it might be very specific questions that we might agree and they're very bespoke for them, or they could be kind of templated things that I send out as well. But I absolutely insist on that self-reflection because that's how they start to not just see the change in themselves, but really identify with absolute specificity. That's another word I can't say. Specificity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you slow it down, Claire, it'll help. Yeah. So they, they can really understand exactly what it is that they're doing and then do more of it. Mm -hmm. And share it with other people. We talked about ripple effect before we started recording. You know, if, if you if you can codify what you're doing, you'll do more of it and you'll do it better yourself. You'll find more opportunities to do it in different situations, but you also want to teach it as well. And then you get a ripple effect. 
And that's how that's that key component into converting all of this, all this work into action. Because again, we're not just doing this for our health. I mean, we are doing it for our health. That's a cheeky turn of phrase, but it is for our health, but we find that health in the action. And part of that action is in the ability to share it. I often find myself thinking about how coaches are excellent translators. They kind of just come in and kind of teach you your own language, add a little bit of insight, add less, definitely, a little, definitely a lot of insight and some guidance, but ultimately you're learning how to speak your own language well, and also do some of that same translation work. So not only do, do, do the effects that, do, do the, not only do the effects that coaching has on you just radiate out from you naturally based on the way that you perform differently and better and engage differently and better and are more your best self, but you also learn a little bit how to do that translation work, how to codify it and how to put it down in a way that is not only continuing to grow your own understanding, but also becomes accessible to other people around you. And, and that's really, I feel like it's what makes coaching almost like addictive is you see that like cascading effect, like ripples in the water where you're just like, you know, a chain and a chain and a chain and a chain. And you've got like people who, you know, 10 degrees of separation away from you who have, with certainty been positively impacted impacted by your coaching and you'll never meet them you'll yeah. likely never bump into them a day in your life or a day in theirs and yet you will have had a positive effect on them and you get to know that that's it's no wonder you have the passion for this work <laughs> <laughs> seeing I that and knowing that to be true absolutely but it's also i choose to imagine that that is the impact that i am having I, I may not be having that impact. Let's say I'm not having that impact, but I choose to imagine that that's the impact that I'm having because in doing so, it makes me want to, you know, master, you know, my skills at what I do. Yeah, it makes me want to do it. We we spoke again before we started to record, you know, about <laughs> loving the work and and actually sometimes you know coming in my office on a Saturday or a Sunday to to write content, for example, because I you know I write quite a lot of content as well as do the coaching. You know, I want to share things with people. Why do I want to share things with people? Because I imagine that it's going to have a really big impact, whether it does or it doesn't. But it's hugely motivational for me to, to imagine that it does. Now, thankfully, I do have enough testimonials to know that it does actually have an impact as well. Yes. Uh, but, I, the, but it's always my starting point. And again, I, it's one of those things that I try and share with, with other people if I'm more mentoring than coaching, let's say, where mm. I'll say, well, you know, wouldn't you be better off having a starting point that assumes that what you are doing is actually going to make a difference, a huge difference? Mm -hmm. Then that's going to give you the energy to want to practice, to want to learn, to want to master the art of whatever ever it is that you're doing to make a difference. I feel like that's such an important question to ask early, because if you ask yourself that question, like is, is what I'm about to do or am doing, is this really going to be like, have the impact I wanted to have on the world, on, on my life, on the people around me and people I'll never meet. And if you come to an answer that's no, that's a good answer because then you get to ask the next question. It's like, okay, how can I then, what can I then do? And how can I then go about having the impact I want to have? And you just, these simple questions that lead you to the next better question and the next better question. And so, as long as you have that, again, you kind of mentioned that self-reflection, how, how key that is to the developmental process, especially as being at coaching someone to just not just to take this all in and kind of just let it sit there and do nothing, but to actually get it out, translate it, do that work and be willing to, I don't know, engage in that journey, engage in that quest for impact. And then there's a, there's a trust factor there too. Cause I, I could tell you trust that even though you will never see it, that your impact is reaching beyond your, your grasp. It's out beyond what you can see, not only because you want to believe that, but because you know that to be true about good coaching. Like you've, you've learned that lesson over yeah. the years and you keep getting that lesson learned over and over and over again. So you trust that natural process. It's like trusting that gravity will work which, yeah. you know, until it doesn't, I'm going to assume that it does. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I believe in coaching so much that when I, when I eventually got to a point at which I started to put, I was going to say pen to paper, but truth be known, I was actually tapping away on a laptop and started mm -hmm. to write my book. You know, I wanted to write a book that was fiction, but about coaching. <laughs> so even though I wanted to write a book of fiction, the subject matter was about 
a, a woman of a similar age, but actually a bit younger than me, who, <laughs> who ends up going to a coach, going to a coach at a point in her life where she is a little bit lost, or as my father said in his book review, it's a good book for if you're stuck in a rut. I don't know if that translates in America. It does. <laughs> So she's in a rut or she's a point in her life where she where she's she's not happy things are not quite how she would like them to be including in her working life um and she comes to a coach and you get to read in the book about the coaching journey and you actually get to almost like be a fly on the wall actually seeing reading listening to dialogue of coaching se- real coaching sessions you know fictional but real because I've kind of taken taken bits from real coaching sessions and put them into the book and the book itself is also this again is showing all my passion it, it's written as Laura's journal so the key character in the book is Laura so I wrote it from the perspective of it's Laura writing her journal every day which is part of her sort of learning process as she goes through the the, the coaching journey and, and that was my passion. That was my way of saying, you know, how do I help with some of the things that happen in coaching? How do I help more people than I can personally get to have one-on-one time with? And every now and again, you know, I, I get to hear from or meet or speak to someone I've never met before who's read my book and they tell me about the difference it has made. And, you know, and, and, and I do that as well. It's like that hand yeah. to the kind of like it's like oh my goodness you know if only we could realize and funny enough I was thinking about this just today if only we could realize when we woke up on a morning and and got up and got on with our day just how many people we have the potential to impact positively neutrally or negatively and chose to make it positive what difference we could make my business is called leaders are mad (laughs) difference and, you know, we all have the opportunity to lead, don't we? You know, lead, take on followers, make a difference to other people. That's my whole thing about it. you don't actually have to be a traditional hierarchical leader to make a difference, but you better be darn sure if you are a leader and people are giving you that title that you are making a difference. And the coaching piece, again, is it, it's integral to that because I want to make a difference for the individual so that they then have that ripple effect and make a difference for the team, for the organization, the, 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 the people who are served by the organization, and even the communities that the organization might operate in. And again, that ripple effect is, is so motivational, not just for me, but then for the coaching client mm-hmm. to then want to make the changes that they come to me with in the first instance. As I expressed when we first started talking, I was already very afraid that I was going to lose track of time as we were talking. We've already been chatting for well over a half an hour. I am, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm probably going to be knocking on your DMs here in a little while and just have you back for a part two and a part three. I have had, not only have I had such a delightful time talking with you, but I feel like we, we got really deep on some really important concepts very quickly, spent a lot of time there. And I honestly feel like I could talk to you for the rest of the day and we would still have just scratched the surface. So before I let you go, and I am going to have to let you go, but do you have any, like, we haven't even really talked specific. We just jumped into the conversation. We basically answered all the questions about what you do and why you do it and how you do it. Is there anything you want to leave with the audience before we go and end this this first part of what I think will be an ongoing conversation? I may just have to hit record on a few more times in the not too distant future. Anything you want to leave the audience with? You want to talk a little bit more about your book, which it sounds fantastic, actually. It sounds like right up my alley. About your business, about how to find you. You have like a website. Do you have like, are you on LinkedIn every day and you're always in your DMs and connecting with people? Like where can people find you, find out more about you, connect with you, all that stuff? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Kevin. And it has actually been wonderful. And I've made a few notes of things that you've said as well. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to think about those. I'm going to reflect on those. But all of the above, I have all of the above. The best <laughs> place to connect with me is my website. So the website is Leaders Are Mad. That's the website. So look me up. <laughs> you can contact me by email. I love to receive emails. I know it's a bit old fashioned, but I love to receive emails actually. So claire at leadersarmad.co.uk. Any of my Instagram, Twitter, etc. I'm not very good on, on that side. I've got to admit, but that's at Leaders Ahmad. And then if you just look me up on LinkedIn, that's where I'll tend to be active on a daily basis on my socials. 
is on my LinkedIn. So just Claire Walton, change agent, I think it is. And I would, yeah, really appreciate some contact from people. Yeah. And I, I got to tell you, I, man, I'm, I'm going to recommend you to all the podcast hosts I know. I'm going to invite you back on probably like as soon as like the, the, the moment this episode hits, goes live and it'd be like, so Claire, the episode just went live. It was really great. When can I talk to you again? <laughs> like, I hope, I hope it comes through. I think it does. I tend to get pretty enthusiastic and my hands start to rise up in the screen. I've had a fantastic time chatting with you. I hope you have too. I really appreciate being able to make the timing happen. I know we're, you know, eight hours time difference, but I feel like we still met each other in the same energy space, the same emotional space. Cause I, yeah, we really connected. I really loved chatting with you. I'm, I keep saying it. I'm so like, trying not to end the call. I don't know if you could tell. I'm trying not to end the podcast because I just love this so much, but I guess it just all sums up to say thank you. I'm really grateful I got a chance to talk to you today and really grateful I get to share this with with our audience. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin. The pleasure is absolutely all mine. And to the audience and to Claire, we'll talk to you again soon.